rules of nature. And because there was uh, three quarks up and down, and they combined together, there was actually eight possibilities. And I remember with joy that the lecturer at the time who was teaching fundamental particle physics at the Cavendish Laboratory, he flashed up there on the screen the Eightfold Path by the Buddha. Because there were eight quarks for that time the fundamental particles of nature. Like, Yay! The Buddha was right. <laughs> it wasn't really sort of anything to do with Buddhism. <laughs> but it was still nice to see Buddhism recognised. <laughs> so these are just elements. It's just looking at stuff. It's not you. It's not something permanent. It's just um, molecules, cells, and so on. But anyway, it's just a way of dividing stuff up so you don't uh, regard them as anything uh, which is belongs to you. And then we get to the gross stuff, the nine child ground contemplations. And every now and again you might, I don't actually I've never seen the nuns do this, only monks. They actually go and give a talk on the nine charm ground meditation contemplations. You see a this is how I see some monks do it. You see a corpse thrown aside in a charm ground. Days are bloated, livid, and oozy filth. <laughs> so I don't know what it is. They really get into this. It's really sort of weird. You know, they should really go and see a therapist, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> really go. But you don't need to do that because even the, the fetid bodies, they have too many autopsies because you, know, you had that opportunity, especially in Thailand. You know, I'm not sure if you could have done that in Sri Lanka. We even did that over in in uh, Perth for the first few years because our president at the time, Dennis, lived opposite the Covenant. So we got permission to go and sign and see some, some um, autopsies. But I remember the story from, uh, many of you know, Bhante G, Bhante Gunaratana. And he had a group of you know, really strong practitioners. And so they read about this, how beneficial it is to go and witness an autopsy. So I forget what town it was, but they, they went to the, <coughs> they went to the uh, autopsy place and they sort of wanted to go inside and can we see an autopsy please, we'll keep quiet. And the guy said, no, you can't do that. So I said, well, now can we actually ask permission of someone? We won't say anything or do anything. He said, no. And they thought they'd just hang around and make a bit of a nuisance of themselves all morning. No, 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 no. So they soon found out they weren't going to be there inside, but there was one of his disciples stuck around longer than the others. And then when one of the, uh, what are they called in the autopsy rooms, the pathology lab, whatever, when one of them actually, one of the assistants uh, came out, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'll oh, just see if I can get into an autopsy. He said, you won't be able to. And you know, he said, look, I'm busy, just don't argue with me. I've got to go and uh, see a lawyer because I'm going through a divorce. And the disciple of Bhante Ji said, I happen to be a divorce lawyer. I can help you fill out the papers for free. <laughs> if you let me in the autopsy room. Really good camera. So, okay, it's a deal. So they went into you know, some sort of recreation room and uh, the lawyer helped fill out all the divorce forms for free. They're really good accurate, cost them a lot of money and after they now fill out. Then the uh, mortuary attendant uh, took him in and dressed him up, you know, in like sort of autopsy assistant clothes or doctor clothes or whatever, and told him, you go in here, but be quiet, don't say anything. And then apparently the, the uh, 
They brought in the corpse, who was an Afro-American, and laid him on the slab. And it's really interesting, the fellow said, they see him a dead body. They tried to keep quiet, and then they were cut him in up, and they said it was a piece of work. He'd had many, many operations. And they couldn't find out why he had died. And they were looking and looking and looking, sort of cutting up this and cutting up that. And one of the doctors noticed, he said, oh, they said it in Latin. And then the lawyers are notoriously unable to keep quiet. <laughs> and he said, oh, the cancer. And everyone stopped and looked at him. He said, who are you? It was not the Latin word for a cancer. It was the Latin word for malpractice. They had made a mistake. The doctors had unfortunately made a mistake and killed this guy. And they just said, well, why, who are you? Should you be in here? Get out. <laughs> he was a lawyer. And they just confessed you know, to uh, medical malpractice. They made a mistake. And in the United States, imagine how much that is going to cost. So they bundled them out as soon as possible. And that was the last time anyone <laughs> from a Buddhist monastery could <laughs> come inside an autopsy room. But anyway, again, when I used to go to those autopsy rooms, the ones, it wasn't the fetid corpses. Now you see those ones. That was Monday morning, dragged from the Chow Pai River, round the back, you know, we knew where to go. And you know, they did look really weird. But it was when you saw someone around your age, the same gender, those are the ones which really hit you, seeing them cut up. Because it wasn't something too far removed from you anymore. A fetid corpse doesn't even look human. But the person who has died of your age, you know, gender, you can see so many things similar. And when they get cut up, that hits you much more because you make the connection. But anyway, you have to go through this. You see a corpse running right a child on the ground after three days old, bloated, livid, oozing matter, then you reflect your own body is the same nature and may become like that, is not exempt from that fate. Or well, you see a corpse thrown aside in a china ground, being devoured by birds, animals or maggots. You reflect that your body is of the same nature, it is may become like that, is not exempt from, <coughs> from that fate. You see a corpse thrown aside in a china ground, a skeleton with flesh and blood held together with sinews. A flesh with skeleton, skeleton smeared with blood held together with sinews. A skeleton without flesh and blood held together with sinews. Disconnected bones scattered in all directions, bones bleached up white the colour of shells, bones heaped up, bones more than a year old rotted and crumbled to dust. Then you reflect your own body is of the same nature, it may become like that, it's not exempt from that fate. In other words, in those days you could go out and see the, the bodies as they want and fade away. Well, it does actually have an effect on you when you see these open cremations that we used to see over in, uh, actually have them in our monasteries. I mean, you get the pile of wood, you put the body on the top. And there was things you learned from the open cremations. Number one, you never lay the corpse on its back. Because if you lay the corpse on the back in open cremation, it's just any sort of uh, people who know anatomy would understand what happened. The heat comes from the back, first of all, you know, you're on top of the fire. And the way just the, the body burns and the muscles contract or whatever, just the corpse sits up. <coughs> so you lay on the back and during the fire you can see the blackened corpse lift up. And sometimes, I've seen this, because sometimes they try and put it on its side because it's a, a um, a pipe in or pipe. Sometimes it turns around just the way it just uh, falls. And then his body comes up and the hand comes up and points to somebody. 
<laughs> that is freaky, that scares people. <laughs> and it just signs, you know, just because the way that the, the muscles contract when they burn. So anyway, that's why you always make sure it's on the side. But anyway, you see, just like everybody else, you die, it's only your body that's also done. Uh, pay too much attention to this body, try and look after it, but eventually it ends up like every other vehicle that goes into the wreckage yard. <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you see some bodies, you know, they, now if they had MOTs, <laughs> you still have MOTs? Yeah, that's right. MOTs, they wouldn't be roadworthy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, so you buy what causes you arise in the body, the body is an agent of cease, and arise, noticing it's arising cause of nature. Or else mind is just a body, that's all, impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not permanent essence, is established in you, necessary for mindfulness of wisdom, essential for liberation. You are the mind independent, not clinging to anything in the world. Another way you are mindful of the body. And all of those body things is just to realize this body will have to be abandoned one day. So it's not going to last. You try and keep it going as best possible, but understand its purpose. By using this body for something, either making good karma, you know, to make sure by the end of the life you realize, yes, you know, you did some decent good things with this body. Gave you some wisdom, gave you some understanding of life, so that your time on this planet, in this body, was not wasted. And just personal anecdotes, I don't know how many Buddhist funerals I've taken in my life so far, hundreds of them. And some are of children who die young, some are people who have lived a full life. And the ones which really distress me it doesn't care about the length of life or the quality of life. People have really made use of their time and made a little difference, an imprint on other people's lives. Really good, kind, generous, wonderful people. It doesn't matter how long they lived. You feel blessed to do their funeral services. But sometimes the people who have been lived are such a long life and they've been so selfish and mean that What's the point? They're the ones which makes me sad. A long life which hasn't really been used for much good. So, we all die. Make sure you use the time between now and your death for a good purpose. Something you'll be proud of. You feel good about. Anyway, the benefits of mindfulness of the body. Now, when mindfulness of the body has been repeatedly practiced and developed, these ten benefits may be expected. You overcome delight and discontent, especially with regards to the body. You know, sometimes my body feels really good, sometimes it's in pain. The delight and discontent with your body and other people's bodies, and it's just the body that's all, it's to be expected. So you don't really worry about delight and discontent. You overcome fear and dread. The fear, you know, that someone comes along and says, oh, you're going to have a biopsy. Uh, oh, what if I'm going to get cancer? Is that fearful? What if it's terminal? Venerable, uh. some of you know Dr. Casey Dabananda. You've seen him before. And I know his doctor. And you now he had some cancer. And when the doctor sort of finally told him, your cancer is terminal, there's nothing more we can do. This monk living in Kuala Lumpur burst out laughing. He laughed his head off. And the doctor, you are the only person I've ever met when said that their cancer is terminal, just laughed. Sadhu, 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 well done. So you know that you've understood something. If the doctor comes up to you and said, you know, it's terminal. Yay, I'm out of here. 
<laughs> then you're not attached to your body. Oh, another thing. Remember, I, I told this, but actually, but Martin was telling me. He said, if somebody, if, if that's right, actually, no, he was, his um, uncle died a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I said, oh, that's a shock. What are you talking about? We can die any time. If you really understand the Dhamma, and somebody calls you and says your relative has passed away, if you say, I expected that, then you've got some understanding of Dhamma. But he was perfectly healthy, he was only 25 years of age. I expected he could die at any time. You may have heard about the Buddhist coroner. The Buddhist coroner got the sack from work. He got fired. Because every time he had to fill out the death certificate, when you had to fill out the section which says cause of death, he'd always write the same thing, birth. <laughs> 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 you know, some of the jokes are actually really deep. You know, that fellow understood the cause of death is birth. So anyway, that's depending on imagination, by the way. But he got the sack for that. So sometimes, I've done many funerals and somebody dies and they haven't completed the autopsy report yet. So it's an opportunity when you know, I get up there and people are asking me, well, why did she die? Birth. And she says, ah, oh, yeah. Anyway, you overcome fear and dread. You can bear cold and heat, hunger and thirst, on contact with flies, mosquitoes, ticks, wind, sun, creeping things. And then had ticks in the original <laughs> list. But we have ticks over in um, Perth. We yeah, had the ticks over in the United States, so I decided to put that and make it a bit more relevant. Uh, wind, sun, creeping things, you enjoy unwelcome words and arisen bodily feelings that are painful and menacing to life. Even unwelcome words, it's just the body, just hearing it. What's it got to really do? How do people really know who you are so they can call you all sorts of silly things? So what do you do? That's it doing me, none of my business, you can say whatever, but it doesn't describe anything about reality. That's why I was taught by Ajahn Chai. In that part of Thailand, the worst thing someone could call you is like a, like a dog, like a cur, like a mongrel. You know, even over here, you know, if you call someone a mongrel or a dog, you know, that's pretty sort of uh, insulting. But he told me, if anyone does that to you in time and they call you a dog, don't get upset, don't get angry, don't respond, except look at your bottom. Look at your bottom to see if you have a tail. If you haven't got a tail, you're not a dog. So I'm sorry, sir, you made a mistake. Why, why do when people abuse you, you get upset? If someone calls you stupid, why does that affect you? Because you think they may be right. Maybe you were stupid. Certainly if you get upset, you were stupid. So if someone calls you stupid, have a look, you haven't got a tail, end the problem. Why? Do we believe what other people say about us? Anyway, you experience when, oh, okay. <coughs> One, two, three, but overcome delight, discontent, fear, and dread, you bear cold and hunger, etc. Four, you experience whenever needed, without difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind, the adhichitta, and provide a pleasant abiding in this very life. Suddenly you jump from like worldly stoicism to the jhanas. What is the link there? 
And the link is because you're mindful of the body, because discontent, delight, fear and dread, so sicknesses and stuff, you detach them from the body. You can let it go. It's just the body. So you're not so attached to it, you can allow it to disappear. In your meditation, one of the reasons why you can't let the body go and get into the mind states is because you're overly protective of your body, concerned about her or him. My leg is aching. My leg has fallen to sleep. When I was first meditating, my leg was starting to fall asleep. It got numb, pins and needles. So I had to move it. And then every time I meditated, I had to move it. I was so fed up with having to keep moving my leg. One day I thought, right, that's it. I don't care. I'm going to sit here. You can pin some needles. Because I thought, I didn't know too much about medicine. If you get pins and needles, that means the blood supply has been stopped going to your leg. If the blood supply stops, you will soon get gangrene. And after half an hour, I'll have to go to the hospital and cut my leg off. And that's fear. You know, that's totally untrue. But fear, anxiety exaggerates and a little mouse becomes you know, a tiger. So I was like, what the hell, I'm going to sit here, I don't care if I have to have my leg cut off. And of course what happened was the fear disappeared and then just the, after about 10 or 15 minutes, the pins and needles just went away by themselves and they did come back again for many, many meditations. I just called the bluff of the body, the fear. It's not yours, the body looks after itself, which means you can let it go. When you let go of the body, you can also let go of sound, hearing. The reason why it's so difficult to let go of noise coming from outside of you is because that's our burglar alarm, our safety. When you're in bed at night, you hear something <coughs> walking towards you, so you wake up. Just like a cat, a cat you think it's asleep, but sometimes you see its ears move. It's half asleep, but the sound hasn't really turned off yet. That's why you have alarm bells, bells, because they're part of our security alert system. We don't have our, like, burglar smells. So, so there's a fire and a nasty smell comes out <laughs> to alert us. <laughs> it sounds. And, you know, lights as well. <coughs> sounds and lights tend to sort of um, get us awake. So that's one of the reasons why sound is one of the last of the senses to turn off. We don't want to turn off. That's what we rely on to make sure that no one is creeping up behind us. There is not something which is going to endanger us. So, but when you can let go of the body, body awareness is not me, not mine, not self, we're independent. Then you can let go of the body quite easy. Which is why you get into the dramas. Oh, it's only sound, no big thing. Oh, you just an ache in the body, yeah, no big thing. It's only just a smell, no big thing. You can let go. That's why it says. This is why the benefits of mindfulness of the body is done to become more accessible to you. You're not living in the world of the body and its five senses. And because of the boundaries, there are the senses and juicy stuff of meditation. You wield the various kinds of supernormal power. Having been one, you become uh, many. Having been many, you become one. This is where, apparently, they tapped into all of this in a movie, haven't seen it, called Matrix, where somebody, there's many versions of him, apparently. You know more about this than I do. But anyway, apparently there was one US Buddhist was a consultant for this movie, 
and so survives from the power to saw these incredible powers from one to become many. Imagine if Ajahn Brahm became many. You'd have so many jokes being hauled at you from all over the place. Drive you mad. One of me is enough. One of you is enough too. Man, <laughs> uh, you come one, appear, vanish. You, you appear and vanish. You go unhindered through a wall or through a mountain as through space. You dive in and out of the earth as though it were water. You walk on water without sinking as though it were the earth. That's why I was really disappointed in this retreat center. The swimming pool has been locked <laughs> and dried out. It's out of bounds because it's winter time. What are you talking about? We can actually find out which one of you really have good meditation. <laughs> How all these people say they can get jhanas and they do all these things? Okay, come on, let's see something. <laughs> Unfortunately, you get a little bit of trouble with lawyers and patient health and safety these days. Oh. Anyway, um, uh, you travel, you walk on water without sinking, as though were stiffly cross legged, you travel in space like a bird. You wield bodily mastery even as far as the Brahma world. The psychic powers. The next one is a more common psychic power. Actually not really common, but people you know, don't really know too much about it. With clear audience of divine ear, you hear sounds both heavenly and human, those that are far as well as near. And this is what I pause actually to tell a story which I saw again with my own eyes when I first went to Wat Ka Pong in Thailand. It was just when there was a monk who claimed to have this power of clear audience. If you're a monk or a nun for the other day who claims any of these powers, you go into dangerous territory. First of all, the monks and nuns have to investigate whether it's real or not. Because if you're boasting, if you're making it up, you have to disrobe. It's considered so serious as saying that sexual intercourse, murder or stealing is the fourth paratica claiming a supernormal attainment you don't have out of pride. You have to leave and you can't ordain again for life. So it's really considered serious stuff. So when this man so claimed that he could hear sounds a long way away. They had to find out whether it was true or not. It was true. And he developed that power. They tested him out in the market, you now about six or seven kilometers you know, from Wat Pa you know, find out what people were talking about, what he thought they were talking about, and it was true. But what happened next was the danger of psychic powers. Once he knew that they were real and everyone else knew they were real, he started developing pride that he was better than everybody else. And it got to the point that one day he sat on Ajahn Chah's chair. He believed he was as good as Ajahn Chah, maybe even better. And Ajahn Chah was really amazing about this, he took him out to his room and talked to him you know, to convince him that you know, he wasn't fully enlightened, he just developed a power and it literally got to his conceit. And then the next morning he bowed to every monk in the dining hall, including me. I don't know what was going on, I'm only just a young monk. And he was so senior, and then he packed his bowl and robes off and went. He did this well because, you know, it was is they were real, but the psychic powers suddenly were real, got to his head and became conceited. Never knew what happened to him. Disappeared probably in some forest monastery jungle by himself. Because psychic powers are, that's their danger. You think you're special. And because of that, so easy to get conceited. Just like those people who have read in the suttas the story of Devadatta. So if you do ever develop any psychic powers, please keep them to yourself. That's not jokey. 
that's, you know, just otherwise it sounds just like fear of your special. And on the same subject, the psychic power which was not even mentioned in there, which was really weird. This one I didn't see is exercised by myself, but I know the monk, and it's almost certainly true. And it was witnessed by a lady, or some of you might know her sister, so I'm going to be quiet about her identity. She was a Thai princess. And so she was going to a meditation class in Wat Bawan, which was led by this Indonesian monk. I knew he would have sort of had some powers. And <coughs> meditation retreat like this. Oh no, they said day, day's meditation. She had her eyes closed, meditating, and she felt there was something going on. You know, sometimes you, know, you feel, well, this is weird, there's some weird energy around. And she opened her eyes, and I asked her many, many times about this. She said, this happened, this happened, I wouldn't like too much of a Because I knew the people probably did. This month she opened her eyes and saw laser lights coming out from his eyeballs. He had his eyeballs open going in to one of the meditators there. This was real stuff. The store of stuff which you expect from Hollywood, but this was real, real life. This month sort of laser lights into this meditator's eyes. The result of that, she scared herself, so freaked out, she got up and left and never went back again. So if, that's what that happens if you demonstrate any psychic powers. You either get proud or you scare other people off. It's too much power, weird stuff. So that's another reason if you do have psychic powers, keep it to yourself. Otherwise, oh, you don't really know. Um, the time. Okay. Okay. The psychic powers have known the right time to stop. <laughs> but I'll just go for a couple more quickly. Uh, you can read the minds of other persons, having encompassed them with your own mind, especially whether their mind is affected by one of the five hindrances or whether it's experienced a jhana. They're reading other people's minds. Number one, it occurs, it happens. Sometimes you get into a reasonable meditation and you can just know what someone is thinking. But it is again scary and invasion of privacy. And tell people that if you do develop that ability to read somebody's minds, why would you? It's like reading a badly composed trash novel. <laughs> To be honest, how many of your minds are worth reading? <laughs> so you have to say, if you read one mind, you never read it again. <laughs> so, the next one, you recollect your past lives, even up to a hundred thousand births. Not just one, huge amounts. And many eons of expanding universes, decaying universes. It's not, <coughs> not one universe. So when people say to me, well in Buddhism, says, how did the universe start? I say, which one? Ten universes ago, or a hundred universes ago? There's been many, not just one. Why do you always think we're so special, that we're in the only <coughs> universe which ever happened? Anyway, that's another talk called in itself. But there you know, there I was so named, of such a family, with such an appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain. There, and now past from there went somewhere else, there I was so named. It's the recollection of past lives. And that's really cool in Buddhism. These days that you can take a shortcut, but there is some um, deficiencies in the shortcut, which is hypnotic regression. But many people actually do that. They get a decent hypnotist, and the hypnotist, the uh, ability of hypnotists to regress you has improved enormously since I was into hypnosis. And that's again with Bernard and uh, Tony Cornell, who was the head leader there. 
and you know, Jeff, Jeff Perry, my mate in Cambridge, and that it's much, much better now. So I think they were saying about 50 or 60% of people can actually get hematized, enough to actually to get very peaceful, all the barriers taken down, and actually to recollect some past lives. And it's amazing to actually, this is one fellow, we're going over time, but I think, shall I finish now? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> 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 I was talking about Four Noble Truths, so okay, let's go and have a cup of tea, but weird stuff, mm -hmm. people love. But anyway, that uh, one of these fellows, he was uh, a good friend, and he, a lay person, a very good Buddhist, but he was always said that he knew that, you know, well, he, he knew how to fly ever since he was a kid. You know, he was born in Scotland. He knew how to fly. And no one had ever taught him, you know, and he tried it, he knew what to do, to fly an aircraft. And he always wondered why. So one day he just got one of uh, our friends over in Perth to actually to hypnotise him, get him back into a past life. It was very skillful just listening to how the therapist could actually just take him into a previous life. And you know, he found that it was Second World War, he was the pilot of a Wellington bomber. He wasn't on operations, but he was flying from Wales to Gibraltar. And his tail plane, tail uh, fin, was uh, malfunctioned, and he crashed on the, air, on the airstrip in Gibraltar. And he remembered so many details. And then they said, that's why I could fly, because I could fly before. But, I went, I'm not really good on sort of uh, Google, Wikipedia, but I had a, a couple of hours, and I got on there to Baltimore air crashes, and found it. There's only one air crash there, a Wellington bomber, a uh, tail fin malfunction, and many people killed. So you can know, find these things, if you want to, and it matches. Which is really weird. But for him, he had to have, you know, see something to actually understand that, oh wow, crikey, that wasn't just a fantasy, that was real. He got the names and everything. But the alternative to that is in the deep meditations, <coughs> either just before the jhanas or even better after a jhana, you ask yourself, what's my earliest memory? Don't say anything more. If you've got enough stillness power, your mind just goes and fetches an early memory. Just like those little dogs train, go and fetch my slippers. I don't know if they do that these days. And the dog runs off and brings your slippers back. Straight away your mind does that. You get an early life memory. <coughs> Earlier, please. It brings you another memory. Earlier. And the difference between the memories which are based on the deep meditation are there's no doubt that that was here. In the same way, do you know your room number? Your room where you stay? It's not a fantasy, you know. That's where you stayed this afternoon, or you stayed last night. Really clear memory without any doubt. That's the difference between the memories from past lives, the past lives based on deep meditation, and that which is based on just hypnosis. Hypnosis, you can find enough details to confirm it anyway. But anyway, that's maybe past lives. So any of you who have any doubts whatsoever about rebirth, reincarnation, whatever you wish to call it, if you do get some deep meditation, some jhanas, you can actually try. See what happens. If it's ready, earliest memory please, it happens. But there is a warning. And the warning for a couple of my disciples, a few of them said this, that they, early life, first of all, when they were a kid, earlier please, sometimes in the womb, earlier please, and that's when they remember the strongest memory from their past life 
which is closest to this one, their death. And when you have these memories, even under hypnosis, but even more so in meditation, you are re-experiencing the event. So they were re-experiencing their previous death. They said that was unendurable, that was terrible, that was traumatic. I said, please don't ever ask people to do that again. And so the, the trick is, it's worthwhile doing, all you need to do is, if you do catch a traumatic, strong memory of your <coughs> previous death, which is the most common, earlier please, and you might well just go back to another memory before your death. But it's still worthwhile doing. As long as you have that in your head, don't stop on this really terrible memory. That guy who was um, flying the Wellington bombers, as soon as he got to that point where he crashed the plane and there's flames everywhere, he said, I need to get out of here, I need to get out of here. You know, even in this life he just could not take the pain in his only memory, still was traumatic. So if that happens to you, remember your previous life and your death moment, earlier please. And then you go past that trauma and get the benefits of knowing your past life. And you see beings passing away, appearing according to their karma. And lastly, most importantly, by realising for yourself with direct experience in this very life, you enter upon the body in the deliverance of mind, deliverance of wisdom, you are the mind one. That's the best one. But all the other ones, they're really cool, they're interesting, can be done. Okay? So now we can have a cup of tea. <laughs> okay. Sadhu. 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 Very good. So who were you in the previous life? <laughs> okay, tea time.